Hi everyone. I want to thank Angie Laird and the rest of the Room team for asking me to give this presentation about demographic, physical, and mental health assessments in the ABCD. So let me start by the learning objectives. Um, I hope by the end of this lecture that you're able to describe the objectives of the mental, physical, and demographic assessments in the ABCD, why we're doing what we're doing. I hope that you'll be able to give some examples of principles that we've been using in the ABCD for assessing particular domains of function. And um, I hope you'll be able to give some examples of kind of known issues or considerations that you should pay attention to when using the ABCD data in reference to mental health, physical health, and demographic data. I want to start by disclosure of interests. I do receive funding from the federal government, but I do not have any participation in speakers bureaus or pharmaceutical research support. And um, as always, always, always needs to be done at the start, a big thank you and acknowledgement. The ABCD is really a huge team of people, investigators, staff, research assistants, and particularly our families and kids who, you know, absolutely make this all happen. We have many, many federal partners who are funding this study um, and, you know, many people who've really been supportive and collaborative. So just want to start out with that. So let me start by talking about some of the principles that we use when thinking about picking particular assessments for use in ABCD. Where possible, we do want to use instruments with documented reliability and validity. Um, that's going to really help to ensure the best data possible. We want to use measurements that are developmentally sensitive and appropriate. Um, and the challenge, of course, with ABCD is that that's going to change over time because what's appropriate for a 9 and 10 year old is going to be quite different than what's appropriate for a 15 and 16 year old. We also want to engage the most appropriate informant depending on the developmental stage and domain. Kids are going to change in terms of kind of what they are able to report on accurately and what they have access to. And parents are also going to change in terms of what they know best about. Um, so we really try to think about that over a course of time. As much as possible, we want to minimize participant burden. If we had all the time in the world, there's so many more things that we would ask about, but we do really need to make sure that families and kids are willing to stay with the project throughout the full 10 years. And so, you know, we do have to think about making sure that it's not onerous for them or unpleasant. We want to be informed by the prior relevant literature in terms of what are the most important things to be looking at and sort of balance that with discovery science, right? Um, you know, we don't want to only go based on known things because that will give us less opportunity to discover new things, but we do have to make choices. And so where, where it makes sense, we're informed by the prior literature. And we're always struggling with this balance between consistency over time. So doing the exact same assessment every wave so that will allow for longitudinal analyses versus changing things when they're kind of need to be changed in terms of developmental considerations and then capturing new behaviors or outcomes as they become developmentally appropriate. And that is just an ongoing challenge in any longitudinal study and the ABCD is facing like that like anything else. So this is a busy graph, but I think it's useful in terms of kind of getting the big picture of where all the assessments are. So baseline in ABCD, as I believe you've already heard about, started when the kids were nine and 10 years old. We do in-person assessments, modulo COVID, um, every year. So year one, year two, year three, we're just starting year four, and we will go through year 10. Then in between the in-person assessments, we do a phone or an online assessment with the youth as well. So there are some behaviors that we have captured every six months in a, a child or a family that's participated in every single assessment. Um, I, sorry about that. I should say ahead of time that much of year three ended up going virtual because of COVID. Um, some of it's in person, but much of it is virtual. Um, and the same with year two, much of it is in person, but some of it is had to move virtual because of COVID. And likely that's going to be true for year four as well. But we are trying to do as much in person as is safe. 
Um, so this gives you, oh, sorry about that. This gives you the sense of the age range of the kids at each of these assessments and then the different domains of assessment. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of these today, but just to give you a sense of what we're doing, substance use and related factors, these little computer monitors indicate sort of surveys through REDCap or other instruments and the timing. Um, I'm gonna talk about mental health assessments today, both parent report about the youth, youth report about themselves, but also parent report about themselves and parent report on family, because that really gives us important converging information. Then physical health and kind of related factors, um, including the kind of the biologicals that we're collecting. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about the demographics. Um, I won't talk about neurocognition or gender identity and sexual health in detail or culture and environment or brain imaging. I believe you're having other lectures on those. But this kind of gives you a big picture assessment of when things are occurring, you know, the every other year assessment, so baseline year two, year four, what will be year six, include the neuroimaging um, and like more extensive, for example, toolbox and more extensive mental health. But then we have other assessments that occur on the off years. And like I said, online. So I'm gonna start out talking um, more specifically about the mental health assessments. And I chair, co-chair the mental health group with Alexi Potter from uh, Vermont. Um, and I will talk about those in detail and then I will talk about the physical health and our demographic assessments. Okay, so what domains are we looking at in terms of the mental health? Well, we are looking at categorical diagnoses because everybody seems to wanna to know that. Um, and we're focusing both on diagnoses that the child might have currently and in the past. And we're also talking about family, the closest we can get to sort of family mental health diagnoses to help us understand both kind of familial uh, effects, genetic and environment. We're also, trying to measure dimensional mental health measures. Um, we could have a whole conversation about why that's equally important to do for as categorical diagnoses. And then we're also trying to measure other kind of personality and relevant trait behaviors or other factors that we know are highly relevant for understanding both risk factors for mental health and consequences of mental health challenges. We're getting at things like stress and life events and friendship relationships, and I'll talk more about those. Um, okay, so mental health diagnosis. So when we started this study, a big challenge was to figure out how we could get uh, categorical mental health diagnoses in a feasible fashion um, that was kind of financially manageable, time manageable, and use the most up-to-date DSM-5 diagnoses. And that was a challenge, quite frankly, when we started the study, because a lot of the instruments that were computerized, and it was gonna be absolutely critical for it to be computerized, um, were based on DSM-4 diagnoses. And while you know maybe some things didn't change a lot, some things did, and we felt that it was important to be starting with the most current DSM diagnoses. Um, we frankly could not afford to have uh, clinicians administering all of these mental health assessments a lot, you know, with 21 different sites, lots and lots of kids, that was going to be a huge financial burden. So uh, we spent a lot of time trying to think about, you know, what could we do that was computerized, current, and financially feasible. So we ended up uh, being fortunate and being able to kind of be a beta testing site for new computerized case ads, which is the kitty schedule for affective disorders and schizophrenia that was being developed by Joan Kaufman and Ken Kobach. And it was computerized. It had three versions. It had a clinician version, which we did not use. It had a parent report, so kind of the parent could walk themselves through. And it had a child report designed for children 12 and older. Um, and what we ended up doing was doing both the parent report and the child report, but for the younger ages, we did the child report research assistant assisted. Uh, so we didn't leave children to do it on their own. Um, and so we have um, you know, that advantage of being a computerized automatic output that can be uploaded into the ABCD data set, but capturing kind of important clinical information. It was designed for DSM-5, so it has updated diagnoses. Um, we uh, 
are kind of assessing a range of different diagnoses, mood, anxiety, psychotic, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, suicide. Um, and then for the child self-report, a more limited number of items, um, partly because, and we can talk about this more, um, children are not particularly good at reporting on externalizing diagnoses, especially when they're younger. And we were also concerned at the start of the study about the burden on the child. So at the start of the study, we did mood, some anxiety and suicide, and we're adding in assessments. And I'll show you that as the children get older. We also have diagnosis for parents and family. So we did a modified family interview for genetic studies or FIGS. Um, I will say up front, it's not perfect. It doesn't go through in excruciating detail diagnostic criteria for every single member of the family, but it is sort of the industry standard in terms of being able to get useful information on family history of mental health. And we think that it's, it, we already know that it's being really informative. Okay, so here's a chart that kind of lays it out in detail so you can see what's happening. These are the youth administered case ads modules. So, oh, sorry, uh, this is the Zoom problem. Um, baseline, you can see that the kids did not do a whole lot. They did mood disorders, which included depression, social anxiety, um, generalized anxiety, sleep problems, and suicidality. We thought that those might be a little bit higher prevalence and things that kids could reasonably report on. We do much less um, on the kind of what we call the off years, like year one and year three, because we try to make that a shorter assessment. So on those off years, um, we continue every year we do assessments of suicidality that we think that's super important. Um, and then starting at year one, kids will get administered the alcohol use and drug use disorder modules if the other substance use assessments give us reason to believe that they've had exposure to substances. So at the early years, very few kids got these modules. We anticipate that that will increase as the kids get older and have more exposure. Um, we have been sort of slowly adding in assessments that we think are developmentally appropriate. So at year two, we added in asking kids about eating disorders and some of the conduct disorder items that we felt parents might not have access to, but uh, you know, kids would be able to report on. Um, and then we are continuing those in year four. We didn't add any new things at year four, and we're still debating whether we'll add new things at year uh, six, which is another kind of longer assessment period. Parents report on much more. So starting at baseline, parents reported on pretty much every module on the case ads, except for aneurysis and capricis and tick disorders, although we added that in. Um, like the kids, we do a much shorter assessment on the off years, one and three. We still try to really hit um, uh, uh, things that we think the kid, we're not getting other reports on. So like psychosis, eating disorders, uh, disruptive disorders, externalizing kinds of things. Um, and then we go back to the fuller assessment at year two. Um, and at year three, we added in tick disorders and we'll be continuing to assess that. Um, we probably won't be adding, I mean, there really aren't any other modules to add. Um, it, we're kind of in discussion whether we'll start dropping things that we ask the parents about in year six as we increase the number of things we're asking kids about. But year six, when the kids are, let's see, 14, 15, 16, is still probably gonna be a pretty important way to get parent reports, um, you know, because they're still gonna have a lot of access to things that are going on with the kids, especially the more externalizing kinds of things. Now, a few kind of scoring and quality control issues that are kind of known issues about the case ads. So symptoms and diagnoses are reported as present absent. Uh, traditionally in the case ads, there is a more um, ex kind of a, uh, I won't call it dimensional, but there's like a zero, one, two, three uh, scoring where like three is, is definite, two is prob probable, you know, one is, not present and zero is like not enough information. Um, at the earlier ways, we felt that um, that was kind of overload. And so we uh, brought things down to zero versus one present or absent. And we're now working with Joan Kaufman and Ken Kobach to think about releasing 
uh, more detailed information. Um, one of the things we did do though um, in release 3.0, which just happened, was to distinguish between items that were purposely not asked versus missing data. And the reason why that's relevant is the way the case ads works is it has screening modules. And if the kid or the parent doesn't hit on um, any of the screen items, the full module is not administered purposely. Um, but we think that some people may want to know whether something was not administered because it wasn't asked, because they didn't hit on the screen versus maybe the kid missed the assessment. So now we make that distinction um, in the most recent release to give people more information. I should also note that there is a, a item in the case ads that says something like developmental disorder, not fully assessed autism spectrum. That is not a valid autism diagnosis. Um, that was not available in case ads 1.0. We are switching over to case ads 2.0 and that has a more developed autism diagnosis, but in the earlier ways, people should not be using that item as a measure of autism. And there was an accidental failure to administer agoraphobia for part of year one. Uh, we changed how we launched the case ads module to make it easier for RAs. And there was just a, a bug that happened and that module didn't get included. So uh, unfortunately we are missing that data, although it's very low base rate. So we don't think it's a, a huge miss. All right, so that is the categorical diagnoses. Every single wave, uh, the child and the parent get asked about current and past. Um, uh, we're working on a, a paper right now to look at the prevalence of diagnoses versus on parent and child report and to look at the consistency of diagnoses. I can tell you now, sort of spoiler alert, parent reports over time are much more consistent than child reports over time. Uh, or at least from baseline to year two. That is not particularly surprising given the literature. Um, uh, it will be interesting to see if consistency of reporting on the part of the child increases over as they get older. Uh, but we can tell you right now that the, the parent reports are more consistent over time. All right, but we also wanted to look at dimensions of mental health because we know that kind of a categorical present absent doesn't always capture the kind of full spectrum of mental health challenges or concerns that people might be having. So we wanted to really get good dimensional measures as well. So in terms of parent reporting, at every wave we have the parents do the full child behavior checklist and just a shout out to the ACEBA group who are providing all of their assessments um, at no cost to the project. Um, just a, a huge thank you to Tom Akebach and the whole team there. So we do the full child behavior checklist um, this is very rich. Uh, it's a uh, you know a hundred plus items. We can get dimensional assessments of, you know, uh, anxiety, depression, dep depressing, <laughs> depression, disruptive disorders, uh, just a whole host of things. So that's I think a very important ongoing longitudinal assessment that we have. Uh, it though I would say the CBCL does not do a great job of indexing sort of items of mania. So we do have a brief assessment that the parents filled out from or fill out from the general behavioral index that get at kind of mania or pre-mania kinds of symptoms. We also introduce a very short social responsiveness scale to get more at kind of autism spectrum symptoms starting at year one. And then we have child reports of dimensional mental health concerns. So uh, one of the things, and if we have time, I'll talk more about this, is one of the reasons the NIMH was particularly interested in the ABCD was to look at the evolution of psychotic-like experiences in youth, particularly in relationship to exposure and use of substances. So we worked with Rachel Lowy and others to implement a developmentally appropriate uh, psychotic-like experiences screening uh, scale starting at baseline. And this work has really been uh, spearheaded by Nicole Karcher, who was previously my postdoc and is now a faculty member and part of the ABCD team. Uh, we also started with a child report measure of mania from an instrument called the 7-Up. Um, we started that at year one. And then we also started asking youth 
to report on their own mental health at the very first six month phone interview using the brief problem monitor, which is a very brief assessment, um, just 20, 20 or 21 items that get at sort of internalizing and some externalizing symptoms. And we've now been doing that every six months. So every in-person assessment and every phone assessment. So that's really beautiful longitudinal data to look at the evolution of these kinds of symptoms from the youth perspective. We also asked the kids a few items about delinquency related behaviors starting at year one. We did have a little glitch. We're missing one item at year two, um, but we've come back to that at year three. We also ask about more positive mood related things um, on the phone interview. And then we started with that in person. Um, I will say that we originally did it partly for kind of positive mood repair because we didn't want to always call kids and just ask them negative things all the time. Um, but we think that that's actually going to be really interesting data too, um, kind of looking at a positive affectivity. And then uh, we've also been getting teacher reports on the brief problem monitor for teachers. We started that at baseline. We have been continuing to try to do that um, every assessment wave. Um, I will say it does get more challenging as youth get older because when kids are younger and they're in grammar school, there's typically a homeroom teacher that's spending a lot of time with the kid. Um, knows them reasonably well. As kids get older, they get into middle school. This will definitely be an issue in high school. This, the, the sort of amount of time a kid has with any one teacher becomes less um, depending on the school that they're in. And so, uh, you know, we will have to kind of look at how those teacher reports go as the kids get older. But we wanted to try to have some reporter that wasn't the parent or the child to help with kind of convergent validity of some of these mental health assessments. All right. Um, we also ask about parents. Um, we want, because, for two reasons really. One, knowing the parent's mental health is gonna be really important for understanding the child's evolution of mental health, both because parents' mental health are is likely a reflection of genetic factors that may be shared with the kids, but it's also an important environmental factor, a context in which the, the child is growing up. Um, so that's gonna be important. It's also important from sort of a measurement perspective because we are asking parents to do a lot of reporting about the child. And we know that an individual's own mental health can color their reports of other people's mental health. So we wanna be able to look at sort of how, to what degree is the parent's report of the child associated with their own mental health to try to tease apart some of that. So starting at baseline, uh, we have the reporting parent um, uh, fill out the adult self-report, which is sort of adult version of the CBCL child behavior checklist, same kinds of domains. Um, and then starting at year two, we also ask the uh, the parent who was consistently coming in with the kid to start reporting on the other parent using the adult behavior checklist. Um, and it, it could be other parent, it could be the other person living in the house. We actually have a nice kind of chart that the RA goes through with the parent to determine who the parent should be reporting about so that it's someone who is spending a significant amount of time with the child so we can kind of capture that influence on the child. And as I already mentioned earlier, we do the family history interview for genetics, the FIGS, um, in order to get that larger family history context. Um, and we can come back and talk about this a little bit more. We did it at baseline and we're having a discussion about when we do it again. Okay, so here is just a, a kind of a visual illustration of when we do everything. So these are the youth report measures here. So you can see prodromal psychosis is every single year. Uh, very rich data. Mania, we're getting on the one, the kind of off year assessments. The brief problem monitor, we get it now at, this should actually be a one here. I apologize for that. We were thinking we were going to switch to the youth self report, which is a longer version for the kids to report on, but the piloting suggested it was really way too long. And so we swapped back to the brief problem monitor. Um, so we have the brief problem monitor now at every in person assessment, this brief delinquency measure and the toolbox positive items. And then again, for the parent, they do the CBCL every year, the mania items every year. 
we did the short social responsiveness at year one and we're discussing, discussing when to do it again. It's thought to be more of a trait-based measure, measure. And then the adult self-report is every longer in-person assessment. And then we started with this adult behavior checklist on the other parent and then the teacher reports. So you can see already that we're always struggling with this balance of wanting to, you know, ideally get everything every year, every assessment with the time demands and sort of balancing that out. Okay, now we also get a number of kind of personality or other measures that we think are relevant. So uh, from the parent report, we've been wanting something more temperamental or personality. So we did the EQ, the early adolescent temperament questionnaire in year two. And then we also added in questions about emotion regulation in year three. From the child perspective, we ask about measures of impulsivity starting at baseline. We think that that's likely very important for understanding substance use and substance exposure. And then we also have youth self-report on their emotion regulation strategies. So things like, do they do reappraisal? Do they catastrophize? Do they suppress? So this again, just is a kind of a tabular form to see, you know, impulsivity we're doing every other year at the longer assessments. We started the emotion regulation items in year three, and then the parents do the EQ. Um, again, here we were planning on doing it again at year four, but the piloting actually, we had something had to go, it was too long. And we decided that probably it makes sense to do this once since it is meant to be more of a trait-like measure. So we did actually drop that at year four. And then we started with the emotion regulation items. Um, obviously things other than self-report are important. Well, I shouldn't say just self-report. Other things other than just like traits and personality. So we've been asking about life events uh, based on parent report. And we've been adding in things as either people recommended it to us or it became relevant. So uh, we've, we were using this sort of standard Phoenix measure, uh, but we added in things related to deportation, foster care, school shootings, and COVID related items. We also added in parents' perception of their own life stress. Again, we think that that probably is a really important contextual factor influencing children. Um, and we did this before we knew about COVID. So that was kind of prescient because I'm sure it's going to be relevant for understanding sort of COVID-related stress impacts on youth. And from the child perspective, we've also been asking about life events. Uh, we also started asking about experiences of peer victimization and perpetration. So, you know, bullying, social victimization, um, both whether it's happening to them and whether they're engaging in that behavior towards others. We also started asking about cyberbullying because we knew that was highly relevant. And we've been asking about things like how many friends do they have? How many close friends do they have since baseline? Um, this is like everything else an area where if we had all the time in the world, there's so much more we would ask, but we're trying to really balance getting rich information with not overburdening the child and the parent. Um, you know, We'd love to know more, for example, about the parents' own life events, which might be somewhat different than the child's life events, because here we're asking the parent to report about things that happened to the child, and we're asking the child to report about things that happened to them. Um, uh, just as an aside, as part of culture and environment, we've also added in what's called the home questionnaire that gets at sort of cognitive stimulation early in the child's life from the parent report. Okay, and this just, again, gives you a sense of when we're administering things. The life events started at year one, and those are yearly. Um, we do get some timing information there. So we ask about lifetime, then we ask if it's happened in the 12 months previous, and then we get, was it good or bad, and how strong was your reaction? So we can get sort of more nuanced information there. All right, some more things to think about. Um, parent and kids don't always agree. That's actually a pretty common finding in the literature, and it is one of the reasons that we included both parent and child reports. 
Um, and we did this in particular, um, you know, for the mood related things where there's evidence that these kind of internal experiences, parents may start to know less about what's going on in the child's head. Um, and, you know, again, spoiler alert, the paper we're working on, there is a great agreement between parent and child diagnostic uh, reports. We are uh, thinking about working with Joan Kaufman and Ken Kobach to develop sort of more integrated diagnoses based on the integration of parent and child report um, that may be particularly useful as the kids get older. It's also the case that different reporters may be better for different types of behaviors. So which measures you use may depend on what you're interested in. Externalizing kinds of things, we know that people are actually not particularly good at reporting on their own sort of externalizing behaviors. And that's particularly true with kids for things related to like ADHD and ODD. Although there may be some things related to kind of conduct issues that only kids are gonna know about. Um, so if you had to make a choice, you might decide to use other reports for externalizing, whereas you might be interested in the person's own perception for more internalizing things or some average. Um, you're going to want to think about consistency over time. We are trying to do our best uh, to develop, you know, to use assessments that can be consistent over time, but it is going to be necessary sometimes to change things as it becomes, you know, more developmentally appropriate or not. And we are having conversations about things like when do we reassess family history? It takes a long time. It's kind of onerous. And one of the things that we'd like to do because family history includes the siblings of the child is sort of wait sufficiently long so that if things are gonna emerge in those siblings or aunts or uncles or things like that that weren't present earlier, we have time to capture those. So we don't think it would make sense to do it like every two years. Um, so we're probably gonna think about redoing that at year five or year six, where there's been some time for new things to emerge that we didn't capture at baseline but also soon enough that parents are still part of the picture. You know, once kids get to be 18 plus at the later waves, you know, we are not necessarily gonna always have access to parent information. So probably gonna reassess that wave five or wave six. All right, um, let me transition then <clears throat> to physical health. Um, originally mental and physical health were one group and we split off because the assessments have gotten more detailed. Um, so this kind of gives you this big picture overview um, of physical health and related factors. And like mental health, we have things that our parent reports about the youth, youth self-report. We have sort of physical objective measurements. We actually are doing Fitbits. Um, so we have actigraphy and sleep information at year two and year four, um, and then various biologics. And I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, okay, so in more detail, what do we get from youth? Well, we get the basics height and weight starting at baseline every year. Um, that's just kind of like the minimum. Um, and we do blood draws um, and we can have a whole conversation about doing blood draws with kids, uh, both for DNA and now we're doing it also to do like panels of uh, health related factors, kind of like, you know, CBC and other sorts of things. Um, now I should say, this looks like there's a zero here. Um, it is the case though, that starting at baseline, um, as many people who, as, who could started to get blood draws. Um, and in particular, the twin sites really focus on trying to get blood draws because one of the things that we needed and wanted to be able to do was to um, type whether uh, kids were monozygotic or dizygotic twins. So I would say probably about 50% of the kids from the twin sites agreed to do blood draws um, at baseline. And now the rates are obviously increasing as kids get older. Um, uh, kids have actually really been troopers about this. Um, and, you know, I would have to say I was somewhat surprised by the number of kids who were really willing to get blood draws. Uh, we started doing things like blood pressure uh, at year two and year four to get kind of more basic um, health related factors. Uh, we have been collecting saliva for DNA starting at baseline and those DNA data have already been released as part of I think 2.0 and again at 3.0. Um, we also have been diligently collecting saliva samples for pubertal hormones, uh, which are being processed by Salimetrics. So that's um, testosterone, DHE, 
DHEA, estradiol and progesterone. And uh, we just had a consortium paper accepted um, that reports on the hormone data and sort of issues around how to process it. Uh, then we also get parent and child report of pubertal development and uh, menstruation um, uh, using the pubertal development scale. And then we also get kids starting at year two to tell us about their chronotype. Um, again, ideally, we would have started doing this at baseline because it would be really interesting to watch the evolution of kind of chronotypes changing as kids move into puberty, where we think, you know, things might start to shift. But just for time reasons, something had to go at baseline in year one, but we were able to add those back in at year two. We started asking about nutrition, kind of kids' uh, food, junk food. Uh, we also added in questions about pain. And this is kind of an interesting area of assessment. And one of the reasons we added it in because there was some suggestion in the literature that kids and adults might start to use substances that uh, they eventually begin to abuse because they are experiencing pain. And then we have kind of global questions about physical activity, like, you know, how many days a week do you exercise at least an hour uh, using the same item from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a big nationwide survey. Um, and then we also get questions about involvement in sports and activities. And then we added in questions about respiratory functioning at year four, which is meant to get at things kind of related to asthma and other factors. And then we also get separate parent report measures as well. Um, we are collecting baby teeth and that will let us actually get at toxin exposure. This is something Elizabeth Sowell at USC has really been spearheading. Uh, we get a pretty rich developmental history from the family. Uh, we did it at baseline and now we're reassessing it at year four, doing an RA administered version just to kind of fill in missing gaps or uh, things that weren't clear. And, and so this is information both about like what mom was exposed to in utero, including substances and alcohol, um, health issues that mom had in utero, uh, things related to, you know, uh, gestational age, prematurity, uh, issues that the kid might have had early in life, developmental milestones. So really a pretty rich assessment of the kid's uh, developmental history. We also get a full medical history at baseline, and then we get updates every year for things that might have occurred over the past year. So again, pretty rich information there. Um, ideally, someday we'd love to be able to get access to electronic health records, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, we get information on what medications the kids are taking. Um, that was actually, well, we could have a Another, it, it was a challenge to do that in a way that made it easy for people to analyze it. And I have to really give kudos to the people in the um, DAIC at UCSD who figured out how to do this. Uh, we get parent reported menstrual cycle information if the parent reported sex at birth is female. We get nutrition information. We get, um, again, pretty rich information about traumatic brain injury with updates every year. Um, and this includes not just like car accidents, but traumatic brain injuries that might occur from sports activities and sports involvement, which is something that a lot of people are very interested in. Pubertal development scale parent report. And then we were able to ask parents to report on sleep and sleep disturbances starting at baseline. Um, so we do have good information about that. And then the parent also uh, reports on kind of sports and other activities involvement starting at baseline. And this is a very comprehensive measure that looks at like all kinds of involvement in sports and non-sports activities, and also kind of gets detailed information about the timing and how much time. Um, so it's really rich information. And then the parent is also now starting to fill out some information on their own physical activity, again, to kind of provide some important context for understanding the youth measures. And then we also added in questions about breastfeeding. All right, um, let me quickly talk about demographics. Um, demographics mean different things to different people. Uh, we obviously get information about sex and gender, and I importantly distinguish between those. Um, at baseline, we were primarily asking parents. Uh, now, the what's called the GISH work group, which is the Gender Identity and Sexual Health Work Group, 
led by Alexi Potter, uh, has uh, dimensional measures of gender identity as well as sexuality. Um, and I think that is, you know, going to give us some really, I keep using the word rich, but I do think it's rich information. Um, we get measures of race and ethnicity from the parent perspective and a lot of detailed options there. We also get country of origin on the family if they were not born in the US along with information about how long they've been in the US. We also get a lot of information about what language is spoken in the home, what languages the child learns. Um, we ask about family income. So we ask about both the parents income and sort of the total household income. Um, we also get information on parental occupation and again, kudos to the um, Data Analysis and Informatics Center for figuring out a way to organize that in a way that's actually gonna be usable by people. We also get family structure, meaning like who's living in the household? Um, you know, if the parents are not together, how much time does the child spend with the other parent? Uh, the family structure is important, not only for understanding the family context in which the child is embedded, but also if you wanna do things like look at uh, income to needs ratios based on family income and the number of people in the household, which can be potentially a more sensitive measure of financial adversity. But we also ask families uh, seven questions about financial adversity that they might have experienced, things like phones being cut off, not being able to pay rent, um, you know, not being able to go to the doctor or dentist because they couldn't afford it, those sorts of things. And we did that because uh, there was work on kind of best practices for measuring um, socioeconomic status and that those best practices suggested that you ask about these things in addition to income and occupation. And if you think about this, this is particularly important for nationwide studies where the cost of living might be quite different in different locations. And so the same income might afford very different things in different places. And so our idea was this family financial adversity might help capture that um, variation that might be somewhat different than just absolute income. And then we also measure neighborhood adversity, the uh, area deprivation index. Um, uh, the available information is from baseline based on census blocks of the reported um, home address at baseline. Uh, there is now a, a, an environmental work group that is working on uh, detailed updates and more of like a long-term trajectory of where the kid has lived over time so that we can look at changes in neighborhood adversity over time. And that ADI index, it has um, a number of different measures as part of it. It gets at things like median income, number of people in the neighborhood with high school diplomas, white collar jobs. It gets at things like uh, homes with complete plumbing. Um, and there's already some data suggesting that um, measures of neighborhood adversity can account for variants in childlike cognition and brain development independent of family income. Uh, so there, I think there's some really uh, interesting information there. And the culture and environment work group has a whole bunch of other measures too. So I'm gonna run out of time. I had hoped that I would have time to show you some really interesting and intriguing early results, but I'm not going to. So I'm gonna skip over that really quick. Um, and I'm happy you can write me if you're interested. So I'll just summarize. Uh, we are always welcoming suggestions for additions in the out years, um, but just keeping in mind our principles and burden, we just can't do everything. Um, now that we're having multiple ways of data, longitudinal analyses are gonna be really the next key step. And as I said before, we'll be shifting more of the assessment to youth as it becomes developmentally appropriate to do so. Um, we think that you know, we'll be able to look more uh, in more interesting ways at sort of trajectories of mental, mental and physical health over time. Uh, people always ask this, but we did, uh, speared by Susan Taper, launch assessments of COVID-19 related experiences and are continuing to do those assessments. So that will really help us to understand the impact of this like major thing that happened in the midst of this study that uh, no doubt is affecting development for everybody in the study. All right, well, thank you very much. I look forward to meeting with you and uh, happy to take questions. And um, thank you again for inviting me.